Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Welcome to The Advocate, your Sunday reminder that important conversations are among the necessary tools for a saner society. Today I'm talking about the myths and realities of Nigerian politics. Samson is speaking on the links between faith, culture and the Nigerian politics. And Debo, who makes his debut today, isn't asking us to put our account number here, I wish he was. Mm -hmm. But rather, he's talking about how our humanity is being politicized. And Raymond is asking who is listening to understand as he history beckons. Today, expect a mix of seriousness, laughter, jabs, and we are here after this break. Welcome again to The Advocate. The myth and reality of politics in Nigeria. As a Nigerian who served on the highest decision-making body of a political party, which is the National Executive Council, has run for the highest legislative office in the land, and I lead one of Nigeria's most ingenious civil service organizations, the Electoral College Nigeria, we can't undermine the myths in politics and governance in our democratic space. And here are a few to run by. Political parties are bad. The first one. Now, political parties are bad is usually a situation in which most of us tend to uh, post our voter apathy towards. We understand what goes on in the American primaries and we are never concerned with what goes on in Nigerian primaries. This distance, which we distance ourselves away from political parties, of course, ensures the fact that we are thrown a selection and we do not participate in an election. The next one will be another myth. A vote for a small party is a waste of your vote. Now, this is funny and very hypocritical because this comes from big parties that tell you this, but still at the end, go ahead and pay for your votes or pay for thugs to stop you from voting, which means that is also a myth. The next myth I'll be visiting is the Constitution is bad. Most people that say the Constitution is bad are people that, I'm sorry to say, have not read the Constitution in entirety. Of course, every Constitution is not a perfect book. The inaction of the legislative arm of government, which is supposed to amend the Constitution continuously and rigorously from 1999 till now, are the failures in which we criticize our constitution for. The state has kidnapped the local government. The handshake of any democracy is the local government. And the local government is non-functional. As we can see, it's not even a democracy because the, fa the fact the local government is being put in a corner by the state as regards its autonomy, its jurisdiction, limits the amount or the dividends of democracy the electorate feels. There's another myth that grassroots circumvent democracy. Now, most people say grassroots circumvent democracy. Are you aware that according to our voters register, the highest voting comes from women, farmers, and people at the grassroots? The truth is, the middle class actually circumvents democracy. Of course, there's the argument. The, the grassroots takes stomach infrastructure. 
Who delivers it? The question is, you never see any of the big politicians carrying money to the grassroots. So the conduit is more guilty, which is the middle class. I will proceed to the realities of politics on ground. Participation is key. As long as we do not participate and we tend to think that only voting is our way forward to changing democracy, we will not get anywhere. There are two other parts that are just as important. And this is holding people in governance accountable and the next being participating within political parties. The next reality is that the president is not always to blame. Government is like, a trip, is like an ocean in which the state governments are like streams and then the ponds behind us are local government chairmen and councillors. They are supposed to be our first point of call to criticize the, the issues we have with power, which is transformer on your street, or poor public transportation, which is under the purview of the local government. The next reality I would like to make clear to our viewers is that the legislative arm is the most powerful arm of the government. Basic democracy was founded in Greece. And the basis of that was a representative government. Only the legislative offers full representation of all the people, peoples of Nigeria. But they have never been criticized to the point or held accountable for their inaction. The legislature has focused on things like constitu constituency projects, which are done nowhere else in the world, and is a direct trample on the, on the executive function of LG chairman. And this has, has made them the most docile part of governance while being the most powerful. The next reality I would like to visit is most politicians do not understand their jurisdiction of office. You see senators, councillors, either cross-referencing with legislative and executive functions, forgetting what exactly their own jurisdictions of office are. Sometimes even the president goes as far as making mistakes or pushing himself towards a legislative promise than an executive action. The next thing I want to make clear, a recall is easier than waiting for a tenure to lapse. If we have someone in governance within the legislative arm, it is harder to wait for his inactions, his or her inactions in government while we wait for the next year to vote him out. A recall takes only 50% plus one it might look hard, but sometimes the cost of inaction in the legislative office can ruin a country. Of course, time will not allow us to exhaust all opportunities to expand rigorously on this point. But as we go along, on some, of, uh, as we go along some of the points will be further elaborated by the panel. Thank you. You know, one of the things I want to bring out, um, I mean, this is a very, uh, very clear expression that you have had here and something is very striking the fact that majority of people who talk about constitution have not even read don't even know you know what is contained in the constitution you know and it's a national problem because the way we tell people to read your bible read your quran read your this i think there should be a system where people are also pushed that way to try and understand you know what's what is really guiding us? Most people come out and they talk about constitution, this, constitution, that, and they don't know what is inside. And you can't change what you don't even know what the content is about. I know that in the past weeks, um, uh, Joyce has been talking about constitution and constitution and all those things. But as much as we keep saying constitution is bad and we don't even know what is even bad? What do you know about the constitution that is bad? A lot of people are coming out on the road to shout it's bad. Now, come and change it. You can't change what you don't know about. And then the second thing you, I also want to point out is the fact, uh, the part of cross-referencing of you know, political office holders. It's not just about their jurisdiction. Most of them don't even know why they are there in political offices. Some of them are just there maybe because situations or events orchestrated they have been in that political office. They are not there because they have any clear map out vision for the people. And that's why you can see someone who is actually in the, in the political office and you are looking over the window to see what the other person is not doing right instead of you, you know, you know doing what you're supposed to do. And you may you said it about the president saying uh, he's doing something as against action. He was supposed, he's supposed to, he takes, makes um, legislative promise against executive action. So it's not really about 
uh, being a political office holder, but much more about knowing why you are there and focusing on, on the things you mapped on your manifesto and then taking those actions. Those are just the two points I want to point out, the, the constitution and also the point of knowing exactly why you are a politician and focusing on why you are in office and not cross-referencing with other people. Um, I would like to add that, you know, we, we, while we, we always say, yes, we can't blame government all the time for certain um, um, situations that we find ourselves in in the country, uh, I think it's also important to ask some important, um, some very good questions. Now we're talking about the Constitution. Um, Mr. Kunle had mentioned that uh, most of the voters that we have in this country are um, characterized by women and farmers and what have you. How many of these people even have access to the Constitution? How many of these people even understand the Constitution? Mm. So basically, the, the bulk of responsibility falls back where? How many people are as educated? Mm. We are sitting down here and we are having this discussion because we have an idea and because we have met one or two. So it boils down to the fact that the people at the grassroots level, that at the end of the day, is perceived because there are some things that I, personally I don't believe in, but I would not like to really state. But at the, uh, at the grassroots level, it's perceived that they are the ones that make these decisions. What do they actually know about the Constitution? Okay, uh, let's let, get the opinion of uh, Mr. Samson, or uh, guest from the Zoom. Uh, Mr. Samson or Dr. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, fantastic views, laudable uh, presentation. Uh, but I, I, the, the, the concern I have with all you have mentioned is the fact that in Nigeria, one thing we don't do well is information dissemination. Sadly, a lot of Nigerians do not even know what their rights are or what their limitations are or what is even, how easy is it to access the, the constitution of Nigeria? Yes, it's available on the internet, but what we do on a daily basis is this in consonance with the constitution of Nigeria and uh, information accessibility is also very, very difficult. So when we talk about assessing uh, in basic information that pertains to uh, or relates to Nigerians, how available are they? For example, there was an issue on, on the internet where you have information about how the, Niger the Nigerian passport, the value of funds that custom, Nigerian custom service is actually, you know, uh, collects, or uh, the, the cost of Nigerian passports. You know, when you go to their website, what you see is different from what you find in reality. Mm. You know, so some, when you begin to have this kind of issues, you have a lot of Nigerians losing hope in the system. And it has got so bad that a lot of Nigerians do not reckon with what the government says, they don't really care anymore because they've been beaten, battered, <laughs> you know, to, to a point where people are actually not stopped. So, yeah, a lot of people do not want to participate in politics because they felt either way, they're not going to win. Either way, it's not about the people. Most of the people that go into politics today are actually about their interests. And we see it play out every now and then. Why are people killing one another because of political positions when you're actually going there to serve the people. So sometimes when you look at all these things, it actually takes interest of some of us who are actually keen about participation. But yes, I agree. If we say we are moving away from participation, automatically we are giving the party to those that will make things easy, for, much more difficult for Nigeria. And that, that's what we are seeing. Because uh, I'm sorry, but if we had as much as people uh, that are better in the country, knowledgeable in the country, I'm not so sure that Nigeria, participating in politics, actively participating in politics, and their interests are protected, I'm not sure Nigeria will be where it is today. We have, we have always had the, the disadvantage of selecting the worst amongst us to rule us, to govern us. And that's why Nigeria is here today. So for me, uh, <laughs> I can't blame Nigerians, but I only encourage Nigerians to participate from okay. the system becomes better. Okay. Um, for me, I, I love the summations you guys put in, but um, we must also critically understand that 
Information is key, and the government has been very, very slow in disseminating information. But that does not mean that intentionally, and that does not mean that we should also sell our country. We only have one country, and we must give this country. We must take this country with the strength of our hands. I'm not anyone. Most people will look at me and say, "Kunle is a politician," but I didn't get here because I come from a rich family or I'm I'm someone different. I just chose to participate, decided to infiltrate the system. And now I'm giving back based on what I've learned. Well, Samson is next after this break. Stay with us. My faith, my culture, and the Nigerian politics. Faith, culture, and politics are inextricably linked. Karl Marx, a popular scholar, elucidated the relationship between the superstructure and the economic structural base in this model of society. He had defined the base as the way society produces what is needed to survive. Marx maintained that substructure determines superstructure. But the innuendo of Marx's postulation revealed that faith, culture, culture, and politics are vehicles of exploitation. In the last 200 years, Christianity, Islam, and chauvinism were doctrines that govern and direct the affairs of men. These doctrines created beliefs that have promoted belligerent faiths and nationalism known today as fundamentalism and parochialism. Against cosmopolitanism, the culture of impunity embedded in capitalism and religious jingoism has destroyed the communalism and culture that African societies were known for. It is pertinent to say that religion was used as an instrument of subjugation and economic slavery, slash colonialization colonialism to subdue Africans who were known to be warriors, communal and traditionalists, wielding supernatural powers. These are our forefathers. This is not to demonize any religious faith, but our realities were the balkanization of our geographical positioning and positioning of our communal life, to the placement of our culture and beliefs with borrowed faith as introduced a societal opium that is known today as dying and smiling which is like sweat is invisible in the rain, a popular phrase coined by Professor Tony Fadula. As a result of this, the culture of accountability, prohibition, engagement, and confrontation that African people were known for have been relegated to the background because of phrases like biblical injunction of Romans 13 verse 1 that says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. Religion has so polluted our culture and political responsibility to a point it has led to political apathy, as well as many ambiguous and esoteric doctrines that are giving room to government agents to throw us back and forth with policies and actions that has impoverished us the more. Why phrases like touch no man, anointed, or a child of God does not fight? We forgot that even religion was taken out over the world through war. How come we expect our freedom to be achieved through peace? Today, our worship centers deemed sacred have been turned to campaign grounds for politicians that are willing to support the work of God. Below are questions playing in my head. I'm hoping I'll find some comfort in the minds of my co-discussant during the debate. What stops us from having a Nigerian version of English like pidgin that everyone can understand? Either they went to regular school or not, respect of their tribe. Why are we afraid to discuss the divisibility or indivisibility of Nigeria as of today? What is the priority of Nigeria as a nation? What is our, what religion or cultural beliefs, you know? And are they not counts? You know, uh, how did we lose history so fast? And why did we allow our religious and political elites realize our history? In closing, I believe in the superiority of rational thoughts over emotions, as well as the ability of technology and science in solving human problems. But our culture and tradition must be brought to bear in resetting our national priorities. Neither should our freedom be a subject of emotion. Uh, that's it. Great um, uh, paper put in by um, Samson, and I think it's very intelligent. I think one of the core problems we've always had is that I think when the Europeans came into Africa, they used religion as a weapon 
And what's most funny is that they got religion and education from Africa, but they weaponized it and used it against us. And it's very, very funny to even note that women used to be highly respected in Africa. We had the Queen Aminas. We had people close to the Oni of Ife, women that were very strong and worked with the Oni closely. So we've always respected gender in Africa, though we were thought to think that we do not understand it. For me, Nigeria must create its own identity and forge forward, thinking properly and redirecting based on our own principle. I'm one of those that's a proponent of saying we must end payments for pilgrimages if we're not paying across for everybody plus if our worshippers and co because we're a secular state not a bi-religious state second pigeon can unify nigeria exactly. we need an identity exactly thank you everyone. you know i was going to wait uh, i actually mapped that out about um about language basically unification of the country uh by language because i know like for instance a country like rwanda where they have only one language that is very, very pre uh, predominant, the Kenya Rwanda language. So even where you come, you don't, there is nothing that divides people. You just get to identify people based on only one thing. So there is nothing like you are Yoruba. And, and you know, when, when we actually identify people based on a particular divide, psychologically, it shapes how we begin to deal with them from that very minute. So, so this person says I'm 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 from I'm from a boy state. This person says I'm from Lagos State. Even if you don't know, unconsciously you just find yourself relating to this person in a particular way, and another person in a particular way. I really think that the 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 pidgin language, if it is actually, of course, again, it's the actionable part that is actually the problem. But then it's a very very vital point that you mentioned. And then the touch note, my anointed part. It was very, very funny. I know everybody was, even uh, uh, Mr. Macaroni was like, ah, touch note, my anointed. <laughs> no, yeah, it's true because um, that's, that's the, the fear. That's how they have been able to, to um, silence people and check those of us that would rather have um, different opinions. Mm. When you say that someone... Uh, when you use that uh, uh, phrase and you say touch not my anointed, that means you cannot question mm. the person. You cannot um, give um, opinions that are contrary to yeah. what the person is saying. Mm. So it puts that person in a position of whatever the person does goes. Yeah. And we need to call I know that. that has been a problem because yeah. at some point, we no longer question certain things, even if they are against exactly. our personal conviction and opinion because it's coming from this. So, of course, Mr. Makoro, <laughs> I would always say, touch by account number. <laughs> <laughs> but every time, every time the state has um, been in love with religion or religion has been interfaced with the state, yeah. what has happened has always been the crusades or something disastrous. Re you know, it's unifying state power with religious power. Mm. It's one of the most dangerous things that can ever happen. Okay. For me, if we are to move Nigeria forward, first divorce that. Another thing that can save Nigeria, I've always been a proponent, end state of origin, state of residence. Exactly. If we start state of residence, a chica can come from Kanu. A Musa can come from Lake Lagos. Exactly. A, a Shegun can come from Enugu. Mm. And once that happens, they can also take political positions. It will diversify Nigeria. That's mm. what America uses yeah. as its strength. Yeah. Yeah. Hillary Clinton was not yeah. born in New York, but she became a senator in New York because yeah. she's lived there most of her life. So I think, we, uh, being honest, we must learn to use our culture to whatever strength mm. we can so mm. that we can develop this country. There's nothing like Nigeria. More than 250 ethnic groups in one territorial boundary. But what we don't have is we have not created an ideology, yeah. which is what drives the nation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with you, Mr. Macroni. You want to say something on that? Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty much like what I, what, I, what I said earlier. Religion, for me, is, is if, if, if not the most powerful um, weapon, or should I say tool. Yeah. You see, the hold that religious leaders have on their followers is very strong. Mm. You find people that cannot even, um, you find people engage with their religious leaders mm. rather than people around them. Mm. 
if something happens to someone, you'll be shocked that some people, they won't talk to their husbands, yeah. they won't talk to their wives. Exactly. They will go to their pastor. Mm. And when, they are, when the um, religious leader says, this is what you should do, the person will they do, it. To do it. So imagine, imagine that type of platform. Mm. And then a political person, a governor, a whatever it is, comes to that setting. And the religious leader is raising the hand of that person up and saying, this is the person that God has shown to me mm. that will move this. Even what, though he is not the even, will of the people. What do you so expect? So now use religion and impose politics you know on the people. So shocking? A particular church. I have doctors that attend that church. When I saw the doctor's position on COVID, I was hurt. Mm -hmm. These are trained medical doctors, mm -hmm. but they allowed religion to form a film of yes. ignorance. Yes. And it, it's, it's bad. You know, most people will say, ah, you're trying to stop God's work. I don't think it was God's intention to turn man into a robot. Mm -hmm. Because if he wanted to do that, he would have just kept all of us in one place and be giving others. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, he, he's giving us free will. And he, he said the, the, one, the difference between man and other animals is that he has given us free will. I don't think religion on any parameter, be it in northern Nigeria or, or in southern Nigeria, should be a parameter to judge how man lives or man works. We've seen, we've seen Arabian countries take themselves to the next level. Yes. And that is because yes. they've opened their borders yes. beyond religious extremism. And the truth is, as much as Nigerians will say it's what we'll call one religion extremist, mm. Mm. I believe another religion are extremists is just that they wear suits while being extremists. Yeah. Mm. And another thing is that what also baffled me is that you know, all the people that are, the politics, the people in the politics sphere, uh, space as, 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 as we find, as, as it were, are also all encapsulated inside this religious stuff. And so when you now begin to also look at how effective politics is working, you are now wondering what exactly are they learning from the religious space? Because most of all these politicians belong to one or two uh, religious settings again. Of course, now is it is for the is the <laughs> grassroots people. Mm. How do you call it? Now the poor man, the carry on for <laughs> you know, you know, No, truthfully, cool because they, they use them. Those one, those ones, you know, because they are less privileged. Mm. They would whatever you say, they would accept. But these people from this religion, that religion, in their corners, they are all friends. They are all friends. They are all exactly. friends, and they That's are playing on the yeah, yeah. Let me be honest. Politicians have found out one thing, and this is a hard thing to say, but it's the truth. Politicians have found out one thing. If, if they delivered governance, nobody would go to church. Mm. I'm sure the church is even in on this. Because if governance were fine, nobody would go to church or mosque. Yes. Because uh, most yes. of the people go to church or mosque for financial gain, for promotion, or for visa or something. They want advancement. Things are not working, if, so they need they a they miracle. Need, the moment those so-called miracles are, are present, yeah. Hmm, you will find out the number of the anointing yes. to be touched. Yes. They need the anointing uh, to we be touched. Saying it, we were saying it before. Um, I, I went to a state just last week, and for every bus stop, I see a, a signpost. So, so state is in the hands of God. Ah. <laughs> I don't understand. I don't understand what that means. So the other states is are in the, the hands legs of God. Of God. So that means <laughs> what that thing is just doing is um, the, the, the government in that state is saying that Anything that happens, it's not uh, in my hand. You know, a friend asked me that question uh, two days ago about a particular state where there is problem, and he's now like, does it mean that this state is also in the hands mm -hmm. of God at this point? Basically, I think if you look at it, uh, religious leaders have more to do um, on this particular topic. Um, so after the break, we're going to take a quick break now, and after the break, I'll be talking about how um, our humanity you know, as a people, is being politicized. Stay with us. Politicizing our humanity. You see, uh, Nigeria today has become a den of unknown gunmen. And I, I say that because for every new report you see now, any news, anything, you see unknown gunmen uh, kills 20, unknown gunmen kidnaps 50. So any small thing is unknown gunmen, and um, the level of insecurity in the country today has risen. You know, so today we no longer ask whether our lives are, uh, and properties are secured. We only ask who is next to be killed or kidnapped. 
you know, uh, we check and we see, okay, whose family is next? Who is going to, who is going to, which family is going to be thrown into mourning? So right now, Nigerians are only waiting and we're waiting and saying, whose turn is it going to be? The level of insecurity in the country has become extremely worrisome. Uh, the, 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 the lapses created by, by government, by the inaction of government. You know, government had the opportunity to nip this, this uh, insecurity in the board. You know, it was, it, when, it, it, when it started, you know, it started like play, play, play. It, it wasn't this bad. It wasn't this bad. But now, um, because of government's inaction, we, we now, we, we, are, we are caught up. And it seems as if there's nothing that we can do about it again. So now, um, it is even worse. It is worse that we as citizens are not making enough noise about the right things. Uh, we are concerned about some other things. So despite the worrisome state of our dear nation, the plague of uh, uh, um, politicizing every, any little thing, you know, we are quick to say, ah, now this party, they run ammo. Now this party, they do ammo. It's because of this party. And so um, right now, it's, we are, we are tri trivializing the, 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 the problems and the challenges that we are facing as a na nation. You know, so there are talks all over social media claiming that the violence and actions leading to the high level of insecurity, um, which now threatens our very existence, are sponsored. Members of the ruling uh, and opposition parties have thrown all caution to the wind and they exchange blames. It is this party, it is that party, rather than just actually recognizing terrorism for what terror terrorism is and taking actions to stop the incidents and killings and kidnappings, which, uh, which is threatening the very existence of Nigerians. We must stand united or fall divided. We must stand united. Then Nigeria is at the very brink. We are at the very brink of war. You know, and I don't think we are saying this enough. I think everyone is just looking at, okay, maybe because the thing never touched me, uh, make we just they look at, and everyone is just, is just playing with the situation. The situation has become so dire, and would worsen if we do not join voices and actions and implore the government to take decisive actions to protect the lives and properties of the people. We must educate and reorientate ourselves. We must advocate for peace and tolerance. Um, negative and um, irresponsible tribal comments. You know, it would, it would, it has no other thing to do than to incite violence. So it, it, it breeds this intolerance that we have for ourselves. And this tribe will say, ah, now nah, these people, no, be these people, if these people come out, we go get peace and all of those things. And then we wonder why some people are killing another tribe and why another tribe is killing another tribe. So I, I feel we must um, be able to um, and preach peace and preach unity, you know, if at all we want to see the end of this um, insurrection. Um, we, okay, I, I, I have always said this, and I think this is, the, this is time to say it again, in terms of if we're talking about security, I think the time for decentralization is now. The power that the federal government wields, in, 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 as far as security is concerned, is too much. And it would seem that even that power now is overwhelming, so, such that they don't even know what to do with the power again. Assign state governments with the task of security responsibilities. Yes, at federal government level, there are some powers that you cannot just take away. But let's, let's the security apparatus in uh, the police, um, security operatives that you have, let them be responsible to state governments. Let state governments take charge. Let them take charge. A governor of a particular state will not be looking at while his state is burning and the governor is crying to federal government to come and help. So, so what then is the duty and what then is the work of the state government? You know, um, we had mentioned earlier, so, but I'm, I'm just going to chip in again, that religious leaders have a role to play. You find religious leaders being totally irresponsible and reckless with the comments that they make. 
knowing fully well the power that you wield as a religious leader, knowing fully well the hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of people that listen to you and take your word as law. You, you need to be very careful. You need to be cautious of how you urge people on. Because comments that you make in ways incite violence against maybe, perhaps other religions. And then you have this religion attacking this religion. Oh, they attacked us first. Oh, they attacked us first. So I think it is, now is the time for, this, uh, for our religious leaders to come together and preach peace. And tolerance is very important. So... Uh, once again, I would, I would say I am conclusively that I think we need the, the there's never been a time to call for peace and to call for um, tolerance um, and to call for unity as now, using our voices, using our platforms to advocate for peace. Because at the end of the day, like I said, it's just turning and turning and turning. And Nigerians are just looking at who is the next person to fall victim. Jebo, brilliant. Thank you. Brilliant. But I'm still going to ask for account number. But very <laughs> brilliant. Very, very brilliant. And I think one of the core problems that Nigeria didn't look at is let's go back to the beginning. Sometime in 2008 or 2009, Nigeria was warned. I was within government apparatus then. Mm. And Nigeria was warned that the fights and the instability going on in sub Saharan Africa was going to affect Nigeria. Mm. Government was also warned that the deforestation of the upper north, Zamfara, mm -hmm. Borno, Katsina, was going to affect, because na man naturally moves towards water, mm. was going to affect and put pressure on the middle belt. This was 2008, 2009. Mm. Nothing was done. This is how many years later? Say 12 years later. We are paying the prices of mm. not listening it's to true. what should have done. There's influx of a lot of people, I would also say, because of political advantages, we brought some of them mm. in. Mm. We are paying the price yeah. for that now. Yeah. Nobody wants to stay this. Mm. And whether we like it or not, I'm bold enough to say, we are also hearing from some reports between communal clashes, between intra-Nigerian local governments within yes. a state. Yes. We borrowed yes. fighters from yes. Chad and Niger to use against our own brothers within the local government. Guess what? They never went back. And now it's, it's and now backfired. The whole melting pot is in Nigeria. We can't handle things. We can't do anything. We must also add the complacency of our security forces. Mm. In How do you expect 400,000 400, policemen, about, sorry, there are about 510,000 policemen right now, 510,000 policemen to police 200 million, 200 people. million people. And of which uh, half now, now with VIP. Yeah. That's exactly what I was exactly. going to say. So, so <laughs> and you stipulates one to 10 at least policemen. No, and no, we are 200 no, million possible. people. 250,000 about policing 200. It's not possible. I think, you know, this issue of security is something that we really need to, you know, Debo said something earlier. We are not really making so much noise about the right things. Yes. You know, we are, we are majoring so much on minor yes. issues, and then the major issues, we, we, are not even we are not even minoring on them, we're just not talking about them. And this issue of security, I think it has to be the number one, the major, you know, uh, priority of any government. Because yes. at the end of the day, it's only someone who is alive that can actually fulfill purpose, that can do a lot of things. Look at what's happening right now. Before, um, uh, but they both said something that is very, very critical. You know, we have this culture, if it is not happening to you, you no, just it say concern, it is happening yeah, to yeah. them. Before now, everybody was thinking that this was about the north. Yes. It was about northeast. Yes. It's in uh, Meduguri. Yeah. It's very far. I can't go there. What, mm. Nothing is taking me there. And gradually, it started coming down. And we could see it's <laughs> just here in Benue. Mm -hmm. Somebody was like, okay, Benue, it is not are here. You, are you negating that. the actions in Ekiti and uh, so, no, no, it's already no, no. here? So I'm it's just saying here. that <laughs> gradually it started coming down. Yeah. And right now, even Southeast, it's not even, uh, you can't even spare. The other day we had that a sitting governor, a sitting governor's house was burnt. Yes. Now I asked myself a question. If a sitting governor... Now, this is the chief security officer of a state. If his house could be burnt, who is safe? Who exactly is safe? If the number one man who is supposed to secure the lives of millions of other persons, mm -hmm. he cannot even secure himself. 
So what are we even talking about? I think we really need to come out and start really decentralizing this security. Because mm. uh, if we have a situation where everybody in a community knows everybody, if a stranger gets into a community, everybody knows that this person is not one of us. And they also know what everybody does. Mm. Once you start going out, I mean, you can't be a palm wine tapper and then all of a sudden, when certain activity starts happening around, they quickly understand that this is not part of our culture. And they can either call it to bear. And if they also go down to this uh, decentralizing security, what also happens is that the laws and the rules and regulation of that particular community will be reinforced. So it's like, uh, in my place, there, there was a time that there was this rule that when people commit offense, they bring them out in the public and they flock them. Mm. Now, you cannot wait for somebody in Abuja to come and flog somebody who committed an <laughs> offense in my community. Because before you even know, uh, you, you even say Jack, the person has already been punished. Mm. And when he's punished outrightly, it sends a message to everyone that, see, nobody is exempted mm -hmm. from this. Because mm -hmm. that's also another thing. In Nigeria, I strongly believe that there are no consequences for actions. For actions, yes. There are no consequences for action. And mm. because there are no consequences for actions, nobody has been made a scapegoat. Mm. Things will continue to recycle around. Mm. Even right there in the, in the security system, mm. people are not, okay, look at all the whole thing that everybody is talking. Nobody is sacked, nobody is sanctioned, mm -hmm. nothing is happening. Things just happen but like But you know, that. I'd like to add this here. I remember when the president was summoned to come out, to come out and visit the House of Rep. And the Attorney General, Malami, said, the House of Rep, based on the immunity of the president, cannot summon the... Of course, there's also, within the Constitution, you won't find the president, too, should brush his teeth at 8 o'clock. But, <laughs> but in the Act creating the National Assembly, it states that the National Assembly can summon any Nigerian. There's no limitation yeah. on that clause. Any Nigerian. Mm. So except they are trying to say it's the bill of Suzanne, uh, Sudan, which mm. we know is not true, mm. as long as it's a bona fide Nigerian <laughs> citizen, whether you are in diaspora mm. or in Nigeria, yeah. the National mm. Assembly can, can summon you. you. I would like to add also that I'm, I've never been keen with state police, and here's the reason why before you guys should be. Mm. The powers that the Constitution grants governors is too high. Mm. I feel a simpler way is even going lower, LG police. If we had local government police, mm -hmm. it would be so simple. Mm -hmm. And we had local government police mm -hmm. that were indigenous to that community. Mm -hmm. If you if you watch we watch movies mm -hmm. now in America, you see sheriffs. Yeah. Sheriffs are local they, and they are usually boys that grow up in the community. The community. They know everybody. They know, they know you can't yeah. if you take a TV, a sheriff knows who did it. Mm -hmm. yes. You don't he doesn't need to ask. Yes. So if we are ready to police in that manner, bringing it down to the local government, which is the basic flat line, yeah. not just state, mm. the basic flat line. I think we might be able to solve a lot I of our problems. I think we should even do one first. You know, we, I think we should do one first. It has come to a point where governors are crying. It's not <laughs> <over the day. laughs> governors are coming out and they are crying that we don't, that we, are, we are helpless. Yeah. Help us. So, I want to buttress on, um, on his point again, where he mentioned um, that there are zero consequences for actions. True. And that is, it is one of the things fighting with us in this country. Look at when, the, you know, this thing started like play, like play, especially the kidnappings. It started, it started and then, yeah, and then uh, all of us were saying, ah, the kidnapped is great. Now look at it today. Almost every day now, mm -hmm. someone is being kidnapped. Mm -hmm. if, even now, is resulting into death. Yeah. They kidnap you, they kill uh, a no, number. But, but now, kidnappers are even getting cheaper. My friend was telling me that off Buari, which is about when you're entering Abuja, they can kidnap you for just 10,000. Wow. Oh. Just money to then, drink. Then, then they, it's a, so so money when we were shouting that the government should do something, should do something, uh, it looked as if some people were troublesome, but they were not able to arrest that situation. You know, now, you know the government, as usual, they will hide behind his PDP of 16 years <laughs> to dodge a No, question. now, recently, no, they, they, they said, no, they said it, is, it is that we are suffering from uh, consequences of 1972 or something. It's no longer uh, 1999. It's no longer, so it's the era of uh, that, Mutalama, that, that I think. That is what happens when you bring Bitamax politicians into a 4D world. Mm. If you use Bitamax videos, you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it at that. Uh, so, um... Yeah, so, well, I wish we, we, we had the old day, you know, to continue to talk about And like we were saying earlier, 
the situation in the country, the challenges that we face will go continue to the talk, the talk, the talk. We know if we finish up, uh, you know. But I won't say we should pray. We don't need pray since. Uh, so now it's time to take action. We must, we must not get tired, you know, of using every means available to us um, to advocate for good governance. Is the least that we deserve. Um, so guys, please follow us on our social media platforms on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag the Advocate NG, or on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, hashtag Advocate NG. Uh, to catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com slash the Advocate NG. We'll go on a quick break and we'll be right back. History beckons. Who is listening hard enough to understand? According to Edmund Bock, those who don't know their history are destined to repeat it. It is a clear truth that Nigeria we know as the most populous black nation in the universe was built by youths in their 20s and 30s. Over the years, this same nation flourished and then went from bad to worse and further down the drain as it is becoming more complicated to even explain. Today, over 60% of our population is made up of young people who have all it takes to identify, deploy, and sustain solutions to emerging global problems, as well as to compete at the peak of any endeavor anywhere in the world. Unfortunately, they have been denied every opportunity to be and show the best God has blessed our country with. Isn't it rather sad that we boost of zero results despite the intimidating potentials enormous resources and abundant wealth that we are blessed with as a nation. Today, we prefer to celebrate our youths from the other side of the divide. How do we keep smiling face knowing that we import everything from toothpicks to even things we can source from our backyard? Anyways, history is filled with examples of individuals, groups, institutions and nations around the world who have had to go through terrible experiences and situations that would have wiped their entire existence, yet had to find ways to stay above failure. More interesting is how they have deployed principles and proven strategies repeatedly to achieve remarkable success. I have been around enough to know that any success or result can be duplicated, provided there is the willingness to learn and apply the same steps and strategies that brought about the result in the first place. Success leaves clues, and all proven principles of success are encoded in history and other people's results. But with all the recent happenings and events in Nigeria on a daily basis, one will begin to wonder why it has been a difficult task to learn from history. History gives us the opportunity to learn from past mistakes. It helps us to understand the many reasons why people may behave the way they do. As a result, it helps us to become more compassionate as people and more impartial as decision makers. I remember my first trip outside Nigeria. I couldn't wait to come back to share and practice most of the things that I greatly admired in those countries, like obeying traffic signals. But it was dashed because there has been no good road to even practice what I saw in those countries. I looked forward to bragging about the best schools and world-class hospitals being situated in Nigeria. But alas, those are dreams and fantasies I am yet to wake up from. Having been to a couple of countries, seeing how these countries are putting visible systems that directly affect the well-being of the citizens, it is obvious that Nigeria has a generation of leaders who are heartless and completely insensitive to the plight of the people. But again, you wonder who is really listening when the call of history is sounding so loud. You know, we, can, we must always say, this is our Nigeria. We don't want to give people a chance. You can imagine, I ran for a political position. Yeah, okay. I was about 40 at the time, 2019. They call me a young politician. When am I going to, <laughs> and they going to start calling me an old politician? And you know, I see, I see like 50 something year old saying, We the youth. I watched something, I watched something today, and they were saying, We the youth was asking for a presidential candidate. And I looked at, I, I said, I know this guy now. I went to check his scene. He's like 56. And he oh said, we the youth. So maybe he's 36. You know the way things used to change. Uh, you know, you know, maybe he can be 36 you know, at I, some point. Uh, I heard in Lagos State, uh, 20 years automatically taken from Like you are 29 now. You yeah, know how you say you are 29, 29 now. Yes, and everybody's adding nine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
<laughs> so so um, we refuse to pay attention to our history. Funny, I think there's a problem we have chosen not to face in Nigeria, mm. and that is we're actually not fighting the older generation. We are fighting our own generation, paid by the older generation. Mm. Mm. We're not fighting the older generation. Mm. That's the honest truth. So we're actually not fighting the older generation. If, if those people refuse to collect the peanuts that they are collecting, mm. No, because who is behind it? No, it's not peanuts. <laughs> it's buying, it's buying house in banana. <laughs> no, it's not peanuts. They are doing well. <laughs> they are doing well. <laughs> they are doing well. They Even are you, well. you cannot ask for the account number. <laughs> I know because no, they, no, are no. Well. they are doing very well. <laughs> so they, are, they are doing very well. Yeah. So, so they, 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 they are the ones that turn against us, and that that has always been the problem of the youth in Nigeria. Now, if you go back into the thirties and forties, the youth had a united front. Mm. And they stood for an idea. Yeah. But now to pull that, they'll say, go away, Joe, who is doing it? Which of you can do it? If a 40-year-old says he wants to be governor of Lagos State, I know what will happen now. His friends will laugh at him. That yeah. In short, let me tell you, go and sleep that mm -hmm. night. It's but uh, we are hoping, uh, Mr. Makoye, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know you are popular now. <laughs> just that. I, wanna, I, I, want, I want to <laughs> add, I want to add that, you see, uh, I made a video. I made a video, um, I think... It was after the second, um, this thing, the one where the police arrested me and when they um, beat me up and all. So I made a video. We saw about two to three, two to four youths, you know, talking, oh, the government is this, the government is that. And one of the politicians comes and then says, ah, he calls one of them. I says, they call me, I have one, um, 150 million that I'm not using, you know. And then he, 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 that one says no in front of everybody. Says no. The politician throws the card on the floor, leaves. The guys, they say, no, 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 no. everybody left. End, end frame. He picks up the card. I didn't show what he was going to do with the card. No. There is a, there is a curse. It's a money curse. I call it a money curse. And uh, people are quick to sell their conscience. People they are quick to sell their conscience such that um, it, it now is very difficult. When some of us are saying, we just want, we just want everyone to have a level playing ground. Mm. We ju just, it's just, not, just, too, much it's not to too much to ask. It's not too much to it's, ask. And you now continue to wonder whether, why is there so much insecurity, so much unemployment, so much this? Is it that difficult for a country that is so blessed? blessed. It's not. But you find out that the youth are working against the youth. Mm. The youth are working in the, against the youth for the, the uh, I don't know what to call them, for those that have spent all of their lives. Those that spent their youth. Their youth, exactly. To, you, you, to, know, to, you know what to, I even find most painful? When you have programs um, or seminars that have been on or virtual seminars, and then they bring the people that have destroyed this country to come and teach us how to how develop to, this to country. Exactly. I, 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 I don't sense. know who does I see some people, even, and again, that's also where you find some religious spaces where uh, because somebody is now a, an acclaimed politician in quotes, uh, and then they now invite him to now say, is a, a man of God. He's a man of God. He's a man of God. Because he can right? open Bible. See, that's what I was he now, saying. He now come and open Bible and then now so we, pray and all the, those things. The atro atrocities that they commit in the name of God in this country, I'm sure God will be like, ah. It, it's insane. <laughs> because I know a particular, about a particular country in, in, in Africa where at some point they closed down 6,000 churches. Closed down 6,000 churches and focused on their ideology, on what makes them unique. They focused on it and while everybody in the world was like, the nonsense, antichrist, blah, 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 blah. Today, that country is one of the most developing countries in, in the continent. And they don't bloody care about you. So at that point, they could not set rules and guidelines. You want to do, you play your church, you want to do anything, you have to align to the guidelines that they have said. The other day, I was on Clubhouse and then somebody was giving an instance how uh, their house where they were living the, 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 there's a mosque in front and there is a, a, a church by the side. So at some point, the church guys came in later and then mounted very big speakers. Earlier on, the mosque were just doing it quietly inside where they were doing it. And they mounted very big speakers and it was facing the mosque. And then the mosque eventually got their own money, raised their own speaker, and it was facing them. Do you know... You, what noise pollution does in developed countries? Mm -hmm. Just play music mm -hmm. and increase the volume in your room. Mm -hmm. In your room, a police will come and give you a ticket. Mm -hmm. 
Come and give you a ticket for noise pollution. So I really think that this country, a lot needs to you know, get in place. Uh, religious sectors, all these people. Young people also need to understand. That, that's, let me also point out that, you see, the NSAS is also one, something that I learned something that is very remarkable. Since I was, I, I'm, like, I was born, that's the first time I saw young people unite together for the very first time. It never mattered where you are from. It never mattered what religion you were coming from. It never mattered your ethnic group. It's all only mattered about one thing, which is what Debo said, a level playing ground for everyone. Oh, and right now, they are forgetting. They are forgetting. Because you cannot see most of these young people who are agitating. Let's go to war. Let's go to war. Let's go to war. And these guys, most of the people who are saying let's go to war, don't really know what war is. I've always said this to, to people that that always make the statement or people that are within the sectors or being paid by you know now mm -hmm. those that are bankrolled mm -hmm. and i've always said this to them i say if you have 100 million and all your friends do not have money you have less than 20 million because you help this one help this one mm -hmm. help this one i say but if all of us in nigeria have 20 if million nobody quit. needs to help anybody you are fine quit. it's greed basic Human greed. greed. Uh, that and um, 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 all of these inadequacies, all of this poverty, this unemployment, this lack of basic amenities uh, is because they are weapons as well. They are weapons used for the politicians, yeah. mm -hmm. used for the politicians to continue to, to, to control this fair. Look at now, there are some campaigns going on with, we pro now, against 2023, already going on that will provide food. <laughs> in that, uh, in food. Why should... And what's the food? Palliatives from COVID. So, I mean, why should that be a topic of discourse now? Mm -hmm. That you will be providing food. So, you will provide food come that time. Why can't they have food now? now? What happened that they've not had food before now? So again, this is a very important issue. Um, it's only somebody who is alive mm -hmm. that will be alive to eat food in 2023. All right, guys. We thank you for your attention while the program lasted. We hope our conversation resonated with you. Little drops of water, they say, make a mighty ocean. Don't forget, the advocacy continues on our social media platforms on Facebook at Plus TV Africa, hashtag the Advocate NG, and on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, hashtag the Advocate NG. To catch up with our previous broadcast, go to plustvafrica.com forward slash the Advocate NG. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Join us next week, same time on this station. Let's keep advocating for a better society. See you next time. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed. It's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you.